The sun doth beat upon the plain fields. Wherefore, let us sit down, Galatea, under this fair oak, by whose broad leaves being defended from the warm beams, we may enjoy the fresh air. Whilst our flock doth roam up and down this pleasant green, you shall recount me, if it please you, for what cause this tree was dedicated unto Neptune, and why you have disguised me thus. I do agree thereto, and when thy state and my care be considered, thou shalt know this question was not asked in vain. I willingly attend. In times past, where thou seest a heap of small pebble, stood a stately temple of white marble, which was dedicated to the god of the sea, and in right being so near the sea, Hither came all such as either ventured by long travel to see countries, or by great traffic to use merchandise, offering sacrifice by fire to get safety by water, yielding thanks for perils past and making prayers for good success to come. But fortune, constant in nothing but inconstancy, did change her copy as the people their custom. For the land being oppressed by Danes, who instead of sacrifice committed sacrilege, and made a prey of that in which they should have made their prayers, tearing down the temple even with the earth, enraged so the god that binds the winds in the hollows of the earth, that he caused the seas to break their bounds, Sith men had broke their vows. Then might you see ships sail where sheep fed, anchors cast where plows go, fishermen throw their nets where husbandmen sow their corn, and fishes throw their scales where fowls do breed their quills. Then might you take view of monstrous mermaids instead of passing fair maids. To hear these sweet marvels I would mine eyes were turned also into ears. But at the last, our countrymen repenting, and not too late, because at last, Neptune, upon condition, consented to ease their miseries. Uh, what condition will not miserable men accept? The condition was this, that every five years day, the fairest and chastest virgin in all the country should be brought unto this tree, and here being bound, though neither parentage shall excuse for honor nor virtue for integrity, is left for a peace offering unto Neptune. Dear is the peace that is bought with guiltless blood. He sendeth a monster called the Agar, against whose coming the waters roar and the cattle in the field for terror shun the banks. And she bound to endure that horror. And she bound to endure that horror. Doth this monster devour her? Whether she be devoured of him or conveyed to Neptune or drowned between both, it is not permitted to know and incurreth danger to conjecture. Now, Galatea, here endeth my tale and beginneth thy tragedy. Alas, father, and why so? I would thou hadst been less fair or more fortunate, for thy beauty will make thee to be thought worthy of this god. To avoid, therefore, destiny, for whom, for wisdom ruleth the stars, I think it better to use an unlawful means, your honor preserved, than intolerable grief, both life and honor hazarded. Father, I have been attentive to hear, and by your patience, am ready to answer. Destiny may be deferred, not prevented. And therefore it were better to offer myself in triumph than to be drawn to it with dishonor. Do you not know, or doth overcarefulness make you forget that an honorable death is to be preferred before an infamous life? I am but a child and have not lived long and yet not so childish that I desire to live ever. Virtues I mean to carry to my grave, not 
gray hairs. I would, I were as sure that destiny would light on me as I am resolved it could not fear me. Nature hath given me beauty, virtue, courage. Nature must yield me death, virtue, honor, Suffer me, therefore, to die for which I was born. The destiny to me cannot be so hard as the disguising hateful. To gain love, the gods have taken shapes of beasts, and to save life, art thou coy to take the attire of men? They were beastly gods that lust could make them seem as beasts. In health, it is easy to counsel the sick. But it's hard for the sick to follow wholesome counsel. Let us depart. The day is far spent. Fair nymph, are you strayed from your company by chance, or love you to wander solitarily on purpose? Fair boy, or god, or whatever you be, I would you knew these woods are to me so well known that I, that I cannot stray, though I would, and my mind so free that to be melancholy I have no cause. There is none of Diana's train that any can train, either out of their way or out of their wits. What is Diana? A goddess? Oh, what her nymphs? Virgins? What her pastimes? Hunting? <laughs> A goddess? Who knows it not? Virgins, who thinks it not? Hunting, who loves it not? I pray thee, sweet wench, amongst all your sweet troop, is there not one that followeth the sweetest thing? Sweet love? Love, good sir. What mean you by it? Bred by desire, nursed by delight, weaned by jealousy, killed by dissembling, buried by ingratitude. And this is love. A fair lady, will you any? If it be nothing else, it is but a foolish thing. Try, and you shall find it a pretty thing. I have neither will nor leisure, but I will follow Diana in the chase, whose virgins are all chaste, delighting in the bow that wounds the swift heart in the forest, not fearing the bow that strikes the soft heart in the chamber. This difference is between my mistress, Diana, and your mother, as I guess, Venus, that all her nymphs are amiable and wise in their kind, and the other amorous and too kind for their sex. And so farewell, little god. <laughs> Diana and thou and all thine shall know that Cupid is a great god. I will practice a while in these woods and play such pranks with these nymphs that while they aim to hit others with their arrows, they shall be wounded themselves with their own eyes. Okay, so Galathea, I don't know what it's about. Yeah. Come, Philida, fair Philida, and I fear me too fair, being my Philida. Thou knowest the custom of this country, and I, the greatness of thy beauty. We both, the fierceness of the monster Agar. Everyone thinketh his own child fair, but I know that which I most desire, and would least have, that thou art fairest. Thou shalt therefore disguise thyself in attire, lest I should disguise myself in affection, in suffering thee to perish by a fond desire, whom I may preserve by a sure deceit. Dear father, nature could not make me so fair as she hath made you kind, nor are you more kind than me dutiful, but how shall I be disguised? In man's apparel? It will neither become my body nor my mind. Why, Phyllida? For then I must keep company with boys and commit follies unseemly for my sex, or keep company with girls and be thought more wanton than becometh me. Fear not, Phyllida. Use will make it easy. Fear must make it necessary. I agree. 
since my father will have it so, and fortune must. Come, let us in. And when thou art disguised, roam about these woods till the time be past, and Neptune pleased. Now, Mariner, what callest thou this sport on the sea? It is called a wreck. Oh, I take no pleasure in it. Of all deaths, I would not be drowned. One's clothes will be so wet when he is taken up. What callest thou the thing we were bound to? A rafter. I will rather hang myself on a rafter in the house than be so hailed in me. But I marvel how our master speeds. I warrant by this time he is wet shod. Did you ever see water as the sea did? But what shall we do? You are now in Lincolnshire, where you can want no fowl if you can devise means to catch them. There be woods hard by, and at every mile's end houses, so that if you seek on the land, you shall do better than on the sea. See? Nay, I will never sail more. I brook not their diet. Their bread is so hard that one must carry a wet stone in his mouth to grind his teeth. Well, I pray thee, how often hast thou been drowned? Fool, thou seest I'm still alive. Why? Be they dead that be drowned? I had thought they had been with the fish, and so by chance been caught up with them in the net again. It were a shame, a little cold water to kill a man of reason, when you shall see a poor minnow lie in it that has no understanding. Thou art wise, from the crown of thy head upwards. Seek you new fortunes now, I will follow mine old. Farewell. Come, let us to the woods and see what fortunes we may have before they be made ships. As for our master, he is drowned. I will this way. I this. I this. And this twelve month, let us all hang here again. It may be we shall either beg together or hang together. It feels not. So we be together, but let us sing now, though we cry hereafter. Rocks, hop, shores, <laughs> and sand and sea. Sing it, lads! Who would dwell in such a hell as in a ship which drunk doth reel, drinking salt from deck to keel on shores and sands and sea? Rocks, Rocks <laughs> shores, <laughs> and sand and sea. Up where we swallowed in wet rain. All soused in waves by Neptune's lakes. What shall we do, being tossed ashore? Find some safe bar to rant and roar. Rocks! <laughs> Shores <laughs> and sand and seas. Please bring my boys to sail on land. For oh, being well then we can try to stand. The trade of thieving never shall fail. Till the hangman calls and we all strike sail. Rocks, huh, shores <laughs> and sand and seas. Roll with that no matter whether in fair or else in stormy weather. Rocks, hook, shores, and sand and sea. Rocks, hook, shores, and sand and sea. Rocks, shore, and sand and sea. Wash, Galatea, that must frame thy affection fit for thy habit. And therefore be thought immodest, because thou art unfortunate. Thy tender years cannot dissemble this deceit, nor thy sex bear it. Ugh! Would the gods had made me as I seem to be, or that I might safely be what I seem not. Ugh. Thy father doteth, Galatea, whose blind love corrupteth his fond judgment 
and jealous of thy death, seemeth to dote on thy beauty. Ugh, but why dost thou blame him? Or blab what thou art when thou shouldst only counterfeit what thou art not. But whilst here cometh a lad, I will learn of him how to behave myself. I neither like my gait nor my garments, the one untoward, the other unfit, both unseemly. Oh, Philida! But yonder stayeth one, and therefore say nothing but, oh, Philida! <clears throat> I perceive that boys are, is, are in as great disliking of themselves as maids. Therefore, though I wear the apparel, I am glad I'm not the person. It is a pretty boy and fair. He might well have been a woman, but because he is not, I am glad I am. For now, under the color of my coat, I shall decipher the follies of their kind. I would salute him, but I fear I would make a curtsy instead of a leg. <clears throat> if I durst trust my face as well as I do my habit, I would spend some time to make pastime. For say what they will of a man's wit, it is no second thing to be a woman. But here cometh a brave train that will spill all our talk. Oh, speed, speed, fair boy. You are <clears throat> deceived, lady. Why? Are you no boy? No fair boy. But I see an unhappy boy. Saw you not the deer come this way? Well, whose deer was it, lady? Diana's deer. I saw none but mine own deer. This wag is wanton or a fool. Ask the other, Diana. I know not how it cometh to pass, but yonder boy is in mine eye too beautiful. Mm. I pray the gods, the ladies think him not their dear. Pretty lad, do your sheep feed in the forest, or are you strayed from your flock? Or on purpose come ye to mob Diana's pastime? I understand not one word you speak. Why, art thou neither lad nor shepherd? Uh, my mother said I could be no lad till I was twenty year old, nor keep sheep till I could tell them. And therefore, lady, neither lad nor sheep shepherd is here. These boys are both agreed. Either they are too pleasant or too perverse. You were best, lady. Make them husk these woods whilst we stand with our bows. And so use them as beagles, since they have such good mouths. I will. Follow me without delay or excuse, and if you can do nothing, yet shall you halo the deer. Uh, I am willing to go. <laughs> Not for these ladies' company, because myself and a virgin, but for that fair boy's favor, who I think be a god. You, sir boy, shall also go. I must, if you command. And would, if you had not. Now, Cupid, under the shape of a silly girl, show the power of a mighty god. Let Diana and all her coy nymphs know that there is no heart so chaste but thy bow can wound, nor thought so stayed but thy shafts can make wavering, weak and wanton. Cupid, though he be a child, is no baby. I will make their pains my pastimes, and so confound their loves in their own sex that they shall dote in their desires, delight in their affections, and practice only impossibilities. Whilst I truant from my mother, I will use some tyranny in these woods, and so shall their exercise and foolish love be my excuse for running away. And then, ladies, if you see these dainty dames entrapped in love, say softly to yourselves, we may all love.
do silly shepherds go about to deceive great Neptune in putting man's attire upon women? And Cupid, to make sport, deceive them all by using a woman's apparel upon a god? I will unto these woods and mark all, and in the end will mar all. Call you this seeking of fortunes? When one can find nothing but bird's nests? Would I were out of these woods, for I shall have but wooden luck. Here's nothing but the shrieking of owls, croaking of frogs, hissing of adders, barking of foxes, walking of hags. Oh, what boy is this? Oh, what a life do I lead with my master. It is a very secret science, for none almost can understand the language of it. Sublimation, almigation, calcination, rubification, incorporation, circination, cementation, albification, and fermentation, but with as many terms unpossible to be uttered as the art to be compassed. Let me cross myself. Then are metals, saltpeter, vitriol, saltartar, chalk, ashes, hair, and what not, to make I know not what. My hair beginneth to stand upright. Would the boy would make an end. And yet such a beggarly science it is, and so strong on multiplication that the end is to have neither gold, wit, nor honesty. Then am I, just of thy occupation. What fellow well met? Well, the fellow, uh, uh, upon what acquaintance? Why, thou sayest the end of thy occupation is to have neither wit, money, nor honesty. And methinks, at a blush, thou shouldst be one of my occupation. <laughs> thou art deceived. Uh, my master is an alchemist. What's that? A man? Hmm. A little more than a man, and a hair's breadth less than a god. Oh, how might I serve him and learn his cunning? Easily. First, seem to understand the terms and specially mark these points. In our art, there are four spirits. Mm, nay, I have done, if you work with devils. Uh, thou art gross. We call those spirits that are the grounds of our art and, as it were, the metals more incorporative for domination. The first spirit is quicksilver. <laughs> it for silver is so quick that I have much ado to catch it, and when I have it, it is so nimble that I cannot hold it. I thought there was a devil in it. Now there are also seven bodies, uh, but, but here cometh my master. Oh, well, this is a beggar. <laughs> no, such cunning men must disguise themselves as though there were nothing in them, for otherwise they shall be compelled to work for princes, and so be constrained to bewray their secrets. Mm, I like not his attire, but am enamored of his art. An ounce of silver, limed, as much of crude mercury of spirits four, being tempered with the body's seven, by multiplying of a ten times, comes for one pound, a thousand pounds, so that I may have only beechen coals. Is it possible? It is more than certainty. I'll tell thee one secret. I stole a silver thimble. Dost thou think that he will make it a pottle pot? <laughs> a pottle pot? Nay, I dare warrant it a whole cupboard of plate. <sighs> what do I hear? With the fire of blood and the corrosive of air, he is able to make nothing infinite. But whist, he espieth us. But Peter, do you loiter, knowing that every minute increaseth our mine? I was glad to take the air, uh, for the metal came so fast that I feared my face would have turned to silver. But what stripling is this? One that is desirous to learn your craft. Craft, sir boy, you must call it mystery. All is one, a crafty mystery and a mystical craft. 
Canst thou take pains? Infinite. <laughs> but thou must be sworn to be secret, and then I will entertain thee. <laughs> Oh, I can swear, though I be a poor fellow, as well as the best man in the Shire. But, sir, I marvel that you, being so cunning, should be so ragged. Uh, oh, my child, griffs make their nests of gold, though their coats are feathers. If thou knewest the secret of this science, the cunning would make thee so proud that thou wouldst disdain the outward pomp. My master is so ravished with his art that we many times go supperless to bed, uh, uh, for he will make gold of his bread. When in the depth of my skill I determine to try the uppermost of mine art, I am dissuaded by the gods. Otherwise I durst undertake to make the fire as it flames gold, the wind as it blows silver, the water as it runs lead. Oh, I must bless myself and marvel at you. <laughs> Come in, and thou shalt see all. I follow, I run, I fly. They say my father hath a golden thumb. You shall see me have a golden body. <laughs> <laughs> I am glad of this, for now I shall have the leisure to run away. <laughs> Such a bald art as never was. Let him keep his new man, for he shall never see his old again. How oh, now, Galatea, miserable Galatea, that having put on the apparel of a boy, thou canst not also put on the mind. Oh, fair Melibius. I too fair, and therefore I fear too proud. Had it not been better for thee to have been a sacrifice to Neptune than a slave to Cupid, to die for thy country than to live in thy fancy, to be a sacrifice than a lover? Oh. Would when I hunted his eye with my heart, he might have seen my heart with his eyes. Why did nature to him, a boy, give a face so fair? Or to me, a virgin, a fortune so hard? It may be Galatea, foolish Galatea, what may be? Nothing. Let me follow him into the woods. And thou, sweet Venus, be my guide. Ugh. Poor Phyllida, curse be the time of thy birth and rareness of thy beauty, the unaptness of thy apparel and the untamedness of thy affections. Art thou no sooner in the habit of a boy, but thou must be enamored of a boy? What shalt thou do when what best liketh thee most discontenteth thee? Go into the woods, watch the good times, his best moods, and transgress in love a little of thy modesty? I will! I, I dare not. Thou must! I, I cannot! Then pine in thine own peevishness. I will not. I will. Ugh. Philida, do something, nay, anything, rather than live thus. How now? What new conceits, what strange contraries breed in thy mind? Is thy Diana become a Venus? Thy chaste thoughts turn to wanton looks? Thy conquering modesty to a captive imagination? Oh, Toulouse, these words are unfit for thy sex, being a virgin. But apt for thy affections, being a lover. 
And can there in years so young, in education so precise, in vows so holy, and in a heart so chaste, enter either a strong desire, or a wish, or a wavering thought of love? Can Cupid's brands quench Vesta's flames, and his Feeble shafts headed with feathers pierce deeper than Diana's arrows headed with steel. Don't oh, leave me yes, because thou art fair, must I be fickle and false my vow because I see thy virtue, fond girl that I am to think of love. Nay, vain profession that I follow to disdain love. But here cometh Yorota. I must now put on a red mask and blush, lest she perceive my pale face and laugh. Lusa, Diana bid me hunt you out, and saith that you care not to hunt with her. Why look ye so pale, so sad, so wildly? Eurota, the game I follow is the thing I fly. My strange disease my chief desire. I am no Oedipus to expound riddles, and I muse how thou canst be sphinx to utter them. But I pray thee, Jerusa, tell me what thou ailest. If thou be sick, this ground hath leaves to heal. If melancholy, here are pastimes to use. If you be in love, before I have heard of such a beast called love, it shall be cured. Why blushest thou, Toulouse? To hear thee in reckoning my pains, to recite thine own. I saw, Eurota, how amorously you glanced your eye on the fair boy in the red shirt, and how cunningly now that you would have some talk of love. I confess that I am in love, and yet I swear I know not what it is. I feel my thoughts unknit, mine eyes unstayed, my heart I know not how affected or infected. If this be love, I would it had never been devised. Thou hast told what I am in uttering what thyself is. These are my passions, Yorota, my unbridled passions, my intolerable passions, which I were as good acknowledge and crave counsel as to deny and end your peril. Uh, how, how did it take you first, Teresa? By the eyes. Oh, my wanton eyes, which conceived the picture of his face and hanged it on the very strings of my heart. Oh, fair Melivius! Oh, fond Toulouse! But how did it take you, Yorota? By the ears. Those sweet words sunk so deep into my head that the remembrance of his wit had bereaved me of my wisdom. Uh, oh, eloquent titterous. Oh, credulous Yorota! But soft, here it come, cometh Ramya. We will withdraw ourselves and hear her talk. I am sent to seek others that have lost myself. You shall see, Ramya hath also bitten on a love leaf. Can there be no heart so chaste but love can wound? Nor vow so holy but affection can violate vain art thou virtue. If love be a god, why should not lovers be virtuous? Love is a god. Lovers are virtuous. Indeed, Ramya. If lovers were not virtuous, then wert thou vicious. What? Are you come so near me? I think we came near you when we said you loved. Now, Romeo, it is too late to recall it. 
to repent it a shame. Therefore, I pray thee, tell what is love. If myself felt only this infection, I would then take upon me the definition. But being incident to so many, I dare not myself describe it. Diana stormeth that, sending one to seek another, she loseth all. Myself, with blushing I speak it, enthralled to that boy, that fair boy, that beautiful boy. What have we here? All in love? No other food than fancy? No, no, she shall not have that fair boy. Nor you, Toulouse. Nor you, Eurota. I love Melibius, and my deserts shall be answerable to my desires. I will forsake Diana for him. I will die for him. I care not. My sweet Titherus, though he seem proud, I am pure to childishness, who, being yet scarce out of swath clouts, cannot understand these deep conceits. I love him. So do I, and I will have him. Immodest all that we are, unfortunate all that we are like to be, shall virgins begin to wrangle for love? and become wanton in their thoughts, in their words, in their actions? Talk no more, Toulouse, your words wound. Uh, would I were no woman? Would Titurus were no boy? Would Toulouse were no body? Uh, it is a pity that nature framed you not a woman, having a face so fair, so lovely a countenance, so modest a behavior. There is a tree in Tylos whose nuts have shells like fire and being cracked, the kernel is but water. What a toy is it to tell me of that tree being nothing to the purpose? <laughs> I say it is a pity you are not a woman. I would not wish to be a woman unless it were because thou art a man. Nay, I do not wish thee to be a woman for then I should not love thee. <laughs> for I have sworn never to love a woman. A strange humor in so pretty a youth and According to mine, for myself, will never love a woman. It were a shame, if a maiden should be a suitor, a thing hated in that sex, that thou shouldst deny to be her servant. If it be shame in me, it can be no commendation in you, for yourself is of that mind. Suppose I were a virgin, I, I blush in supposing myself one, and that under the habit of a boy were the person of a maid, if I should utter my affection with sighs, would not then the, that fair face pity this true heart? Admit that I were as you would have me suppose that you are, and that I would with entreaties, prayers, oaths, bribes, and Whatever can be invented in love, desire your favor. Would you not yield? Tush, you come in with admit. And you with suppose. What doubtful speeches be these. I fear he is as I am, a maiden. What dread riseth in my mind. I fear the boy is as I am, a maiden. Hush, it cannot be. His voice shows the contrary. Yet I do not think it, for he would then have blushed. <clears throat> have you ever a sister? If I have but one, my brother must needs have two. But I pray, have you ever a one? Uh, 
My father had but one daughter, and therefore I could have no sister. He is as I am, for his speeches be as mine are. What shall I do? Either he is subtle or my sex simple. I have known diverse of Diana's nymphs enamored of him, yet hath he rejected all, either as too proud, too disdain, or too childish, not to understand, or for that he knoweth himself to be a virgin. I am in a quandary. I will once again try to him. <clears throat> You promised me in the woods that you would love me before all of Diana's nymphs. Aye, so you would love me before all Diana's nymphs. Can you prefer a fond boy as I am before so fair ladies as they are? No, yeah, why should not I as well as you? Come. Let us into the grove and make much one of another that cannot tell what to think one of another. Rafe, my boy is run away. I trust thou wilt not run after. I would I had a pair of wings that I might fly after. My boy was the veriest thief, the errantest liar, the vilest swearer in the world. Otherwise, the best boy in the world. He had stolen my apparel, all my money, and forgot nothing but to bid me farewell. That will I not forget. Farewell, master! Well, thou hast not yet seen the end of my heart. I would I had not known the beginning. Right. The fortune of this art consisteth in the measure of the fire. For if there be a coal too much, or a spark too little, if it be a little too hot, or a thought too soft, all our labor is in vain. And often doth it happen that the just proportion of the fire and all things concur. Concur? Con dog! I will away. Then away. In art, quoth you, that one multiplieth so much all day that he wanteth money to buy meat at night. Oh, but what have we yonder? What, a devout man? He will never speak till he be urged. I will salute him. Sir! Can thou not see that I was calculating the nativity of Alexander's great horse? Why? <laughs> what are you? An astronomer. <gasps> what? One of those that makes almanacs? Ipsissimus. I can tell the minute of thy birth, the moment of thy death, and the manner. I can tell thee what weather shall be between this and Orgesimus or Taus Mirabilis Annus. I can tell thee things past and things to come. And with my cunning, Measure how many yards of clouds are beneath the sky. Nothing can happen which I foresee not. Nothing will. I hope, sir, you are no more than a god. I can bring the twelve signs out of their zodiacs and hang them up in taverns. I pray you, sir, tell me what you cannot do. Uh, but what be those signs? As a man should say, Signs which govern the body. The ram governeth the head. Oh, that's the worst sign for the head. Why? Because it is the sign of an ill you. Tush, that sign must be there. Then the bull for the throat, Capricornus for the knees. Oh, I will hear no more signs. If they be all such desperate signs. But seeing you are, I know not what to term you. Shall I serve you? I would fain serve. I accept thee. I will teach thee the golden number, the epact, and the prime. Oh, fortune! Come, let us in! What news have we here, ladies? Are all in love? Are Diana's nymphs become Venus's wantons? 
Is it a shame to be chaste because you be amiable, or must you needs be amorous because you are fair? Oh, Venus, if this is thy spite, I will requite it with more than hate. There is an unknown nymph that straggleth up and down these woods, which I suspect hath been the weaver of these woes. Go search her and bring her. I will go with speed. Go you, Larissa, and help her. I obey. Your chaste hearts, my nymphs, should resemble the onyx, which is hottest when it is whitest. And your thoughts, the more they are assaulted with desires, the less they should be affected. Oh, my dear nymphs, if you knew how loving thoughts stain lovely faces, you would be as careful to have the one as unspotted as the other beautiful. I blush, ladies, that you, having been heretofore patient of labors, should now become apprentices to idleness and use the pen for sonnets, not the needle for samplers. Is Diana's chase become Venus's court, or are your holy vows turned to hollow thoughts? Madam, if love were not a thing beyond reason, we might then give a reason of our doings. Lady, so unacquainted are the passions of love that we can neither describe them nor bear them. Oh, foolish girls, how willing you are to follow that which you should fly. Oh, but here comes Toulouse. We have brought the disguised nymph, and have found on his shoulder Psyche's burn, and he confesseth himself to be Cupid. How now, sir? Are you caught? Are you Cupid? Thou shalt see, Diana, that I dare confess myself to be Cupid. And thou shalt see, Cupid, that I will show myself to be Diana, that is, conqueror of thy loose and untamed appetites. Did thy mother, Venus, under the color of a nymph, send thee hither to wound my nymphs? Let Venus, that great goddess, ransom Cupid, that little god. Thine own arrow shall be shot into thine own bosom. I will teach thee what it is to displease Diana, distress her nymphs, or disturb her game. Diana, what I have done cannot be undone. But what you mean to do, shall. Venus hath some gods to her friends. Cupid shall have all. <laughs> Are you prating? I will bridle thy tongue and thy power. All the world shall see that I will use thee like a captive and show myself a conqueror. Come, have him in, that we may devise act punishments for his proud presumptions. We will plague thee for a little god. We will never pity thee, though thou be a god. <laughs> Nor I. Nor I. This is the day wherein you must satisfy Neptune and save yourselves. Call together your fair daughters and for a sacrifice take the fairest. For better it is to offer a virgin than suffer ruin. If you think it against nature to sacrifice your children, think it also against sense to destroy your country. If you imagine Neptune pitiless to desire such a prey, confess yourselves perverse to deserve such a punishment. You see this tree, this fatal tree, whose leaves, though they glisten like gold, yet threaten to fair virgin's grief. To this tree must the beautifulest be bound until the monster Agar carry her away. And if the monster come not, then assure yourselves the fairest is concealed, and then your country shall be destroyed. Therefore, consult with yourselves, not as fathers of children, but as favorers of your country. Let Neptune have his right if you will have your quiet, and so I depart to provide ceremonies for the sacrifice and command you to bring the sacrifice. They say, Tidurus, 
that you have a fair daughter. <laughs> if it be so, dissemble not, for you shall be a fortunate father. It is a thing holy to preserve one's country and honorable to be the cause. Indeed, Meladius, I have heard you boast that you had a fair daughter, then the was more beautiful. I hope you are not so careful of a child that you will be careless of your country or add so much to nature that you will detract from wisdom. I must confess that I had a daughter, but alas, my child's cradle was her grave and her swath clout her winding sheet. I would she had lived until now. She would willingly have died now. For what could have happened to poor Melibius more comfortable than to be the father of a fair child and sweet country? No, uh, Melibius, dissemble you may with men, deceive the gods, you cannot. You have conveyed her away, that you might cast us all away, bereaving her the honor of her beauty and us the benefit, preferring a common inconvenience before a private mischief. <laughs> it is a bad cloth, Titterus, that will take no color, and a simple father that can use no cunning. You make the people believe that you wish, that you wish well when you practice nothing but ill, a wishing to be thought religious towards the gods when I know you deceitful towards man. You have a fair daughter, Titterus, and it is pity you are so fond a father. <laughs> Betrayed to frowns of spite, to eyes of scorn, and what in madness now see torn. The boy in pieces, let her come. Let her come here and let him her doom. Hear ye, hear ye, hear. Has any lost a heart which many sighs hath cost? Is any cousin of a dear which as a pearl disdain does wear? Here stands the thief, let her but come. Let her come here and tell him her doom. Hear ye, hear ye, hear. Is any one undone by fire and turned to ash through desire? Did ever any lady? Let her come here and tell him her doom. Let her come here and lay on him her doom. And in her tears he shall be drowned. Come, Cupid, to your task. First you must undo all these lovers' knots, because you tied them. If they be true love knots, tis unpossible to unknit them. If false, I never tied them. Make no excuse, but to it. Love knots are tied with eyes, and cannot be undone with hands. Had Diana no task to set Cupid to, but things impossible? I will to it, I will to it. Why, how now? You tie the knots faster. I cannot choose. It goeth against my mind to make them loose. Let me see. Now, tis impossible to be undone. It is the true love knot of a woman's heart. Therefore cannot be undone. That falls in sunder of itself. It was made of a man's thought, which will never hang together. You have undone that well. I because it was never tied well. Do the rest, for she will give you no rest. Why do you lay that knot aside? For death. 
Why? Because the knot was knit by faith and must only be unknit of death. Come, let us go in and tell that Cupid hath done his task. Stay you behind, Larissa, and see he sleep not, for love will be idle. And take heed you surf it not, for love will be wanton. Let me alone. I will find him somewhat to do. Lady, can you for pity see Cupid thus punished? Why did Cupid punish us without pity? Is love a punishment? It is no pastime. <sighs> Venus, if thou sawst Cupid as a captive, bound to obey that was wont to command, fearing ladies' threats that once pierced their hearts, I cannot tell whether thou wouldst revenge for it for despite, or laugh at it for disport. How now, Cupid? Begin you to nod. Mm. Come, Cupid. Diana hath devised new labors for you that are god of loves. You shall weave samplers all night and lack yet to Diana all day. How like you this, Cupid? I say I will prick as well with my needle as I ever did with mine arrows. <laughs> Come, Cupid, you must to your business. <laughs> this day is the solemn sacrifice at this tree, wherein the fairest virgin, were not the inhabitants faithless, should be offered unto me. But so over careful are fathers of their children that they forget the safety of their country and fearing okay, become cool, unnatural. You know. okay, cool. I'm glad I was because I laughed out loud when I saw you. <laughs> That's adorable. She was. Their slights may blear men, deceive me, they cannot. I will be here at the hour and show as great cruelty as they have got done craft. And well shall they know that Neptune should have been entreated, not cousined. I, uh, I marvel what virgin the people will present. It is happy you are none, for then it would have fallen to your lot because you are so fair. Ah, if you had been a maiden too, I need not have feared, because you are fairer. I pray thee, sweet boy, flatter not me, speak truth of thyself, for in mine eye of all the world thou art fairest. These be fair words, but far from thy true thoughts. I know mine own face in a true glass and desire to see it in, and desire not to see it in a flattering mouth. Oh, what I did flatter thee and that fortune would not flatter me. I love thee as a brother, but love not me so. No, I will not, but love thee better because I cannot love thee as a brother. Seeing we are both boys and both lovers, that our affection may have some show and seem as it were love, let me call thee mistress. I accept that name, for diverse have called me mistress. For what cause? Nay, uh, there lie the mysteries. <laughs> uh, will not you be at the sacrifice? No. Why? Because I dreamt that if I were there, I should be turned to a virgin. And then being so fair, as thou sayest I am, I should be offered as thou knowest one must. But will not you be there? Uh, not unless I were sure that a boy might be sacrificed and not a maiden. <laughs> Why then? You are in danger. Uh, but I would escape it by deceit. But seeing we are resolved to be both absent, let us wander into these groves till the hour be past. I am agreed. For then, my fear will be past. Why? What dost thou fear? Nothing. 
but that you love me not? I will. Mm, poor Philida, what shouldst thou think of thyself that lovest one that I fear me is as thyself is? And may it not be that her father practiced the same deceit with her that my father hath with me, and knowing her to be fair, feared she should be unfortunate? If it be so, Philida, how desperate is thy case? If it be not, how doubtful. For if she be a maiden, there is no hope of my love, if a boy a hazard. I will after him, or her, and lead a melancholy life that look for a miserable death. No more masters now, but a mistress, if I can light on her. An astronomer? Of all occupations, that's the worst. He told me a long tale of Octagesimus Octavus and the meeting of the conjunctions and the planets. And in the meantime, he fell backward himself into a pond. So I asked him why he foresaw not that by the stars. <laughs> oh, but soft. Is not this my brother Robin? Yes, as sure as thou art right. What, Robin? What news? What fortune? Oh, faith, I have had but bad fortune. But I prithee tell me thine. I have had two masters. One said that by multiplying, he would make of a penny ten pound. Oh, ay, but could he do it? Could he do it, quoth you? Why, man, I saw a pretty wench come into his shop, where with puffing and blowing and sweating, he so plied her that he multiplied her. How? Why, he made her of one, two. What, by fire? No, by the philosopher's stone. What, have philosophers such stones? Aye, but they lie in a privy cupboard. Oh, why, man, I served a fortune teller who said I should live to see my father hanged and both my brothers beg. So I conclude the mill shall be mine and live by imagination still. Thy master was an ass, but my other master was an astronomer, which could pick my nativity out of the stars. I should have half a dozen stars in my pocket if I have not lost them. Oh, but here they are. <clears throat> Soul. Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus. Why these be but names? I, but by these he gathereth that I was a jovialist born on a Thursday, and that I should be a brave venarian and get all my good luck on a Friday. Tis strange that a fish day should be a flesh day. Oh, soft! Here cometh that noble villain that once preferred me to the alchemist. What? Rafe? <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, uh, no doubt you had a warm service of my master, the alchemist. Twas warm indeed, for the fire had almost burned out mine eyes, and yet my teeth still watered with hunger, so that my service was both too hot and too cold. Uh, but where hast thou been since? With the brother of thine, I think, for he hath two brothers, as he saith, uh, seeking of fortunes. Tis my brother Dick! I prithee, let's go to him. Come then, and go with me, and I will bring ye to him straight. Bring forth the virgin, the fatal virgin, the fairest virgin, if you mean to appease Neptune and preserve your country. Here she comes. 
miserable and accursed Hebe, that being neither fair nor fortunate, thou should be thought most happy and beautiful. Art thou the sacrifice to appease Neptune and satisfy the custom, the bloody or custom, ordained for the safety of thy country? Hi, Hebe, poor Hebe, men will have it so, whose forces command our weak natures. Nay, the gods will have it so, whose power dally with our purposes. The Egyptians never cut their dates from the tree because they are so fresh and green. It is thought wickedness to pull the roses from the stalks in the garden of Palestine for that they have so lively a red, and whoso cutteth the incense tree in Arabia before it shall commit it sacrilege. Shall it only be lawful amongst us in the prime of youth and pride of beauty to destroy both youth and beauty, and what was honored in fruits and flowers as a virtue to violate in a virgin as a vice? But, alas, Destiny alloweth no dispute. Die, Hebe! Die, Hebe! Woeful Hebe, only accursed Hebe. Farewell, sweet delights of life, and welcome now the bitter pangs of death. Farewell, you chaste virgins whose thoughts are divine, whose faces fair, whose fortunes are agreeable to your perfections. Enjoy and long enjoy the pleasure of your curled locks, the amiableness of your wished looks, the sweetness of your tuned voices, the content of your inward thoughts, the pomp of your outward shows. Only Hebe biddeth farewell to all the joys she conceived and you hoped for, that she possessed and you shall. Farewell, the sovereign of all virtues and goddesses of all virgins, Diana whose perfections are impossible to be numbered and therefore infinite, never to be matched and therefore immortal. Farewell, sweet parents, yet to be mine, unfortunate parents. How blessed had you been in barrenness. How happy had I been if I had not been. Farewell, life! Vain life, wretched life, whose sorrows are long, whose ends doubtful, whose misery certain, whose hopes innumerable, whose fears intolerable. Come, death, and welcome death, whose nature cannot resist because necessity ruleth, nor defer because destiny hasteth. Come, Agar, thou unsatiable monster of maiden's bloods and devourer of beauty's bowels, glut thyself until thou surfeit and let my life end thine. Why abatest thou thy wanted swiftness? I am fair, I am virgin, I am ready. Come, Agar, thou horrible monster, and farewell world, thou viler monster. The monster is not come, and therefore I see Neptune is abused, whose rage will, I fear me, be both infinite and intolerable. Take in this virgin, whose want of beauty has saved her own life and spoiled all yours. We could not find any fairer. <gasps> Neptune will. Take in this virgin back to her father. Fortunate he be. How shalt thou express thy joys? Nay, unhappy girl that thou art not the fairest. Had it not been better for thee to have died in fame than to live with dishonor? But alas, destiny would not have it so. Destiny could not, because it asketh the beautifulest. I would, Hebe, thou hadst been beautifulest. Come, Hebe, here is no time for us to reason. It had been best for us thou hast been most beautiful. <laughs> hmm. We met the virgin that should have been offered to Neptune, for like either the custom is pardoned or she not thought fairest. I cannot conjecture the cause, but I fear the event. Oh, but soft, what man or god is this? Let us closely withdraw ourselves into the thickets. 
And do men begin to equal with God, seeking by craft to overreach them, that by power oversee them? They dote so much on their daughters that they stick not to dally with our deities. I will make havoc of Diana's nymphs. My temple shall be dyed with maiden's blood, and there shall be nothing more vile than to be a virgin. Oh, Neptune, hast thou forgotten thyself, or wilt thou clean forsake me? Hath Diana therefore brought danger to her nymphs because they be chaste? Shall virtue suffer both pain and shame, which always deserveth praise and honor? Praise and honor, Neptune? Nothing less except to be commendable, to be coy and honorable, to be peevish. Sweet Neptune, if Venus can do anything, let her try it in this one thing, that Diana may find as small comfort at thy hands as love hath found courtesy at hers. She hath taken my son Cupid, Cupid, my lovely son, using him like a apprentice, whipping him like a slave, scorning him like a beast. I muse not a little to see you two in this place, at this time and about this manner. Uh, but what say you, Diana? Have you Cupid captive? I say there is nothing more vain than to dispute with Venus, whose untamed affections have bred more brawls in heaven than is fit to repeat in earth, or possible to recount in number. I have Cupid, and will keep him not to dandle in my lap, whom I abhor in my heart, but to laugh him to scorn that hath made in my virgin's heart such deep scars. Scars, Diana, call ye them that I know to be bleeding wounds. Therefore, Neptune, if ever Venus stood thee, instead fervored thy fancies, or shall at all times be at thy command. Let either Diana bring her virgins to a massacre or release Cupid from his martyrdom. It is known, Venus, that your tongue is as unruly as your thoughts, and your thoughts as unstayed as your eyes. It were unfit that goddesses should strive, and it were unreasonable that I should not yield. And therefore, to please both, Attend. Diana I must honor, her virtue deserveth no less. But Venus I must love, I must confess so much. Diana, restore Cupid to Venus, and I will forever release the sacrifice of virgins. If, therefore, you love your nymphs as she doth her son, or prefer not a private grudge before a common grief, answer what you will do. I account not the choice hard, for had I 20 cupids, I would deliver them all to save one virgin, knowing love to be a thing of all the vainest, virginity to be a virtue of all the noblest. I yield. Larissa, bring out Cupid. And now shall it be said that Cupid saved those he thought to spoil. I agree to this willingly, for I will be weary how my son wander again. But Diana cannot forbid him to wound. Well, I'm glad you are agreed, and say that Neptune hath dealt well with beauty and chastity. Here, take your son. Sir, boy, where have you been? Always taken, first by Sappho, now by Diana. Alas, poor boy, mine arrows broken, thy wings clipped, thy brands quenched, thy bow burnt, and thy arrows broke. Aye, but it, it skilleth not. I bear now mine arrows in my eyes, my wings on my thoughts, and my brands in mine ears, my bow, my mouth, so as I can wound with looking, fly with thinking, burn with hearing, shoot with speaking. Well, you shall up to heaven with me, for on earth that wilt lose me. But soft, 
What be these? Those that have offended thee to save their daughters. Why had you a fair daughter? I and Melabius had a fair daughter. Where be they? In yonder woods, and methinks I see them coming. Well, your deserts have not gotten pardon. But goddesses jars. This is my daughter, my sweet Philida. And this is my fair Galatea. Unfortunate Galatea, if this be Philida. A cursed Philida, if that be Galatea. And wast thou all this while enamored of Philida, that sweet Philida? And couldst thou dote upon the face of a maiden, thyself being one, on the face of fair Galatea? Do you both being maidens love one another? I had thought the habit agreeable with the sex, and so burned in the fire of mine own fancies. I had thought that in the attire of a boy there could not have lodged the body of a virgin, and so was inflamed with a, a sweet desire, which now I find a sour deceit. Now, things falling out as they do, you must leave these fond, fond affections. Nature will have it so. Necessity must. I will never love any but Philida. Her love is engraven in my heart with her eyes. Nor I any but Galatea, whose faith is imprinted in my thoughts by her words. How you like this, Venus? I like well, and allow it. They shall both be possessed of their wishes. For never shall it be said that nature or fortune shall overthrow love and faith. Is your love unspotted? Begun with truth, continued with constancy, and not to be altered till death. Die, Galatea, if thy love be not so. Accursed be thou, Philida, if thy love be not so. Suppose all this, Venus, what then? Then shall it be seen that I can turn one of them to be a man, and that I will. Is it possible? What is to love, or the mistress of love, impossible? How say ye? Are ye agreed? One to be a boy presently? I, I am content so I may embrace Galatea. I wish it, so I may enjoy Philida. Soft. Daughter, you must know whether I will have you a son. Take me with you, Galatea. I will keep you as I begat you a daughter. Titterus, but let yours be a boy, and if you will, mine shall not. Nay, mine shall not, for by that means my young son shall lose his inheritance. Why then get him to be a maiden, and then there is nothing lost. <laughs> If there be such a changing, I would Venus could make my wife a man. Why? Because she loves always to play with men. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are both fond. Therefore, agree to this changing or suffer your daughters to endure hard chance. How say you, Titterus? Shall we refer it to Venus? I am content because she is a goddess. Neptune, you will not dislike it? Not I. Nor you, Diana? Not I. Cupid shall not. I will not. Mm. Then let us depart. Neither of them shall know whose lot it shall be till they come to the church door. One shall be. The suffice and satisfy a us both, does it not, Galatea? Yes, Philida. Come, 
Robin, I am glad I have met with thee. For now, we will make our father laugh at these tales. What are these that are so male partly thrust themselves into our companies? Forsooth, madam, we are fortune tellers. Fortune tellers? Tell me my fortune. Oh, we do not mean fortune tellers. We mean fortune tellers. We can tell what fortune we have had these 12 months in the woods. Let them alone. They be but peevish. Yet they would be as good as minstrels at the marriage to make us all merry. Hey, ladies, we bear a good consort. Then shall you go with us and sing Hymen before the marriage? Are you content? Content? Never better content! For there we shall be sure to fill our bellies with capons, rumps, or some such dainty dishes. Then follow us!